Hi and welcome. Thank you all for joining us in today's episode featuring Stefan Hartman. Hi, Stefan. Welcome. Glad to be back. I know. I'm going to link our first interview in the description box below so that everybody can get to know you a little bit better and what you do. Um, but first, let's share again with our audience a little bit of a background about, about what you do and about also your approaches to diet, which are very not like the mainstream, to say the yeah. least. So I'm a conventionally trained PA, physician associate. I practice now in my own clinic, Iron Direct Primary Care, and it's a unique blend of anti-aging medicine, functional medicine, but with an ancestral diet approach. So it's precision medicine, and when we recommend dietary modalities to treat certain diseases, we're watching it with laboratory parameters. And in this lecture, we're going to be going through some of my protocol for monitoring patients. I'm going to explain a bit the, about these complicated labs that not everybody agrees on, even in functional medicine and conventional medicine. Uh, some of these lab parameters, not everyone agrees on. So we're going to just go through my interpretation, what I've seen in the data, and why we're monitoring these as we're manipulating diets with patients to treat diseases. Awesome. Stefan, before you go over them, can you update us a little bit on what you've been doing with your personal like diet and exercise? Yeah, so my uh, goal is always to perform at the highest level for tennis. I train for professional tennis tournaments, but I'm also balancing that with trying to maintain a really good physique. So not a bodybuilder physique, but kind of just athletic physique. And so my experimentation is with keeping myself in a lower inflammatory state so I don't develop injuries like tennis elbow, and then maintaining my energy throughout really high intensity matches where I'm playing out in the sunlight for three hours straight uh, against kids, you know, sometimes half my age. So I've been experimenting with dietary methods, uh, supplementation to try to enhance my ability to maintain both good physique, but a high performance in a uh, both an aerobic and anaerobic capacity. Do you train every day for tennis? Uh, when I'm preparing for a tournament, I do, yes. So yeah. cool. All right, okay, I think we're ready. All we're right. The, the labs, we're gonna talk about hormones and lab testing and what does it all mean, whether or not you should order them and I'll let Stefan do the talking today. <laughs> all right, here we go. So you should be able to see my screen now. Yeah. So these are some lab, labs that I got a couple months ago, and we're just going to go through them. So this is pretty much my, my most comprehensive panel that I would order for someone who tells me, you know, they want, they want the, the best labs possible. So we start out here, LH and FSH. These are precursor, kind of like, you can think of them signaling molecules that tell your body to create sex hormones, right? We're all interested in that. Testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. Both men and women have this. So you can see here, I have a natural amount of LH and FSH. Someone taking testosterone replacement, you would often see these suppressed. This is why oftentimes it's thought that taking testosterone replacement suppresses fertility, more difficult to conceive from men. Um, I also believe that taking oral contraceptive or contraception for women also suppresses uh, natural ability uh, to, you know, obviously produce normal hormones. They say, you know, it, it's fine. It's, it's, it, you give them a synthetic hormone and uh, it's, it's like progesterone, it's like estrogen, but I found this not to be the case. When I do hormone panels on women on these oral contraceptive devices, intrauterine devices, they have postmenopausal levels of hormones. So yeah. while their LH and FSH may be okay, they have very low progesterone or they have low estrogen, uh, they have low testosterone. So they're essentially what I would see in a female who's maybe 80, 90 years old. Wow. Um, even, even 80, 90 year olds have better hormones yeah. than some women on these devices. And after devices too, hormones don't always come back in women. So this is a huge area of controversy. And a lot of people uh, don't like me because I talk about this, but I'm trying to raise the warning about this because just how we would say it's maybe not the best idea to put a teen on testosterone replacement because it could affect his fertility. The same concept, right? Why do we not apply this to women? Yeah. Why do we say it's fine to put women on this sort of, you know, yeah. hormone replacement, synthetic hormone replacement that affects their fertility? Obviously, it's a contraceptive device, but why don't we think about it long-term for fertility, for 
athletic performance for uh, you know your overall hormone health. Yeah. Um, so here are my testosterone levels when I checked them initially. So total testosterone 861 and a free testosterone of 16. This is a pretty good natural levels. I was actually able to push this even higher with um, uh, you know basically some red light therapy. I think <laughs> so. These. Yeah, I did red light therapy every day on my testicles for about a month. <laughs> on your testicles? Huh? I, I yeah, I was able to push my testosterone up into the red line area. I was about 930 and free testosterone got up to about 18, 19. That is the funniest thing. Where did you get the idea to do that? I have a whole tower in my living room and I was uh, researching a ways to improve testosterone naturally and i came across red light therapy i was like well let's test it out on myself and you know i changed no other parameter except that i'm a big believer in red light therapy i need to also order some you know masks at least for my skin you know but i know like having the whole thing would be even better like there are like huge devices so yeah we got a whole tower in body costs about a grand uh but i love it it makes you feel more relaxed and you feel like you're going to sleep so do you, the, the device that you have, if you share it with me, can people find it? Can I get like the link to the Amazon? Um, oh, yeah, no, I didn't buy it from Amazon. No, oh. I think it's from uh, the company. I'll try to figure out where I got it. I don't remember. Okay. Okay. So um, question, Stefan, how old are you? 29. 29. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you know, what I've been seeing in the, the male patient population is really low testosterone. So I'm kind of an outlier here. I don't, there's no, there's no patient in my practice who has a testosterone of this level. Um, I'm seeing a lot of reasons for this. So there can be uh, dietary reasons for low testosterone. A lot of people following standard American diet, um, eating a lot of processed food, seed oils, and so forth. Um, the sunlight is another huge important factor for testosterone production. So I try to get out uh, get myself exposed to the sun. I consider vitamin D not a vitamin, more a hormone. I think it's a precursor hormone for testosterone. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, I've been experimenting with patients, you know, they'd be doing a uh, carnivore, ketogenic diet, all sorts of diets, uh, intermittent fasting diets. And I see testosterone levels fluctuate based off these diets. And it's not always a positive. So always important to monitor, you know, testosterone when you're doing these dietary modalities, because you can see it go both ways. Some guys will improve. Some guys won't. It'll actually go the opposite direction. So hmm. super important to monitor. Could it be that the fat content of a carnivore diet can affect whether or not your testosterone goes in the opposite direction of what you want it to? I think it's not only fat. So I've seen it in many different scenarios. So you have one patient, a strict bodybuilder does low fat. Uh, does carbohydrate and uh, it crushes their testosterone, right? Yeah. I think it may be because they're restricting cholesterol, right? Cholesterol right. is the building block of testosterone. And I've seen it other ways. Guys strict carnivore, strict keto over long term. I've seen this crush their testosterone. I had a guy, he did a, a raw milk fast for 21 days to see if he could prove his cholesterol panel. It improved his cholesterol panel. It crushed his testosterone. And so Diet has a huge role on your sex hormones. And I think it's very difficult to trick your body. Uh, we have to understand from an ancestral perspective. So in times of stress, when we were running from the tiger, when we had famine, were you interested in procreation? No. Your right. body was trying to suppress that, say, hey, we've got to survive. We probably shouldn't be having any more children. They'll probably starve. So from an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense that if you are tricking your body into starvation mode, maybe with prolonged fasting, maybe even intermittent fasting or restricting carbohydrates or restricting cholesterol, any one of these or a mixture of all of them, they could totally put you into a low testosterone or a low estrogen, low progesterone level. Wow. Okay. That's very interesting. Those and that's what I've seen in clinical practice. What? And that's what I've been seeing in clinical practice when we, yeah. uh, when when we you're do running these. labs. Yeah. Okay. Here's sex hormone binding globulin. And yeah, there's can an, we, can we explain first for everybody? What is SHBG or sex hormone binding globulin and why we should care about it? Yeah. So uh, 
the sex hormone binding globulin is uh, essentially the ability to transport free testosterone through the body to the tissues to get where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. um, we often see an age-related decline in uh, testosterone levels, and we'll see an increase in sex hormone binding globulin levels. Mm -hmm. So we like to see a balance of sex hormone binding. We don't see, want to see it too low. We don't want to see it too high. Um, okay. I often see it in obese individuals. They'll have a sometimes a high SHBG. Uh -huh. um, you know, right. we know obesity lowers testosterone as well. So there's an interesting mechanism here. I've talked about this on my channel before about the MOSH, the male associated uh, hypogonadism, where you get stuck in a very vicious, vicious cycle of high uh, fat mass and low testosterone. Uh, the high fat mass increases estrogen, the estrogen drives down testosterone, the low testosterone and high estrogen increases fat mass. So you get into this circle of uh, yeah. very difficult to get out of. Like a catch-22 situation. Right. Yeah. Uh, that, that's one of the reasons we see patients struggle so much with uh, yeah. getting out uh, these, these fat, oh, these obesity syndromes. Right. Okay. And so that's where I come in oftentimes and, you know, patients, they come to me, they've tried these diets, they get the yo-yo, the weight comes on, the weight comes off and they're like, I'm still struggling. And so that's where we look at hormones and so we looked at hormone optimization. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a good determinant to see if someone's natural or not. Mm. Uh, well, estradiol, estrone. So for a male, you need estrogen as well. You know, a lot of guys out there, they'll, they'll think they can just crush their estrogen, take aromatase inhibitors, and crush it into the ground. Well, you're going to run into joint pains. Uh, you're going to run into maybe some cognitive issues, some neuroinflammation. Estrogen is neuroprotective uh, for men as well. And so we, we do need some estrogen in us. We don't need a lot, though, right? We're going to get gynecomastia, right? We're going to get more fat mess. If you're drinking a bunch of alcohol, alcohol is going to increase your estrogen too. You know, it's, yeah. uh, it's a huge in our media culture, like the manly men with the beer. Uh, this is so far from the truth, specifically beer and IPAs. They're super high estrogen uh, converters. Uh, you yeah. don't want to be assuming that. And you mentioned gynecomastia, which is basically moobs or man boobs. You start, yes, having development of the mammary glands. Um, and that's just... Uh, estrogen dominance basically it sure is yeah and now bodybuilders run into this issue too and this is likely because doing too much testosterone at super high doses this will get converted actually into estrogen and bodybuilders mm. some of them are savvy and know this and they'll take aromatase inhibitor reloxethine and astrozole to stop this process um, but they can still develop gynecomastia yeah if you're taking a lot of steroids, very high dosage. Some of it might convert into estrogen. Is there so? What what are the differences between estradiol uh, and estrone? There's three different types, and uh, you can test for these quite easily on salivary levels. Um, I don't always test for all of them on uh, the serum panel because it gets quite expensive. Um, but they're different forms. They're different uh, strengths and uh, potencies. Mm -hmm. uh, women need all, all three of them, you know, for optimal fertility levels, for, for feeling uh, excellent. When we do hormone replacement for women, we'll typically do biest, and it's a combination of two of them. Mm. Um, they're different, different potencies, but they, they all conjugate and they work together harmoniously. Okay. Um, let's see. And we talked about that, aromatase inhibitors, progesterone. So it's actually a mystery what progesterone does in men. Progesterone in women is super critical, right? To fertility, it's very hard to conceive and it's very hard to maintain a pregnancy without adequate levels of progesterone. Mm -hmm. This is something I help for many women who come to me, difficulty conceiving, difficulty maintaining pregnancies. And I find it's low progesterone pretty often. This, um, it's a huge issue for women out there. They get this thing called estrogen dominance, where there's a ratio of estrogen progesterone, and I'm just not seeing proper ratios in women commonly. Right. We, so what it, is it's not necessarily the absolute amount of progesterone that's low. It's relative to estrogen that's often the problem. That estrogen to progesterone ratio is off, whereby you have way more estrogen to compared to your progesterone. 
Yeah. And when will, um, you know, they'll get all these syndromes, right? We label them with PMS uh, or anxiety, irritability, um, all these things, right? And when you look at the hormone panels in women and you see what's going on, you're like, oh, wow, well, your progesterone is quite low for where you are in your cycle. We have to understand that women have a cycle and these hormones are changing all throughout the month. But we try to capture hormones when we do these tests at about day 21. That's in the luteal phase. That's when progesterone should be at its highest. Yeah. Uh, if it's not at its highest, that and that aligns with the clinical syndromes. You know, the woman is suffering with, you know, weight gain, uh, headaches, um, you know, feeling irritable, not feeling best. Uh, this is oftentimes because the progesterone estrogen ratio just isn't there. And we can optimize that with herbal medicine. We can optimize that with nutrition getting rid of maybe uh, xenoestrogens in the diet, you know, plastics, uh, soy products, where women are bombarded with these xenoestrogens. You can probably relate to some of them. You know, women put on a lot of cosmetics and things. I through, know. I through their know. skin, it gets absorbed into the bloodstream and you have yeah. to kind of read those ingredient lists and kind of be aware, do you want that in your bloodstream? Is this affecting your hormones? Yeah, I know. I'm always, I went through a phase where I would buy all the natural products. Like I would go to Whole Foods and like spend a fortune on, on makeup. That's all like, you know, clean makeup. And then it was like, I don't know. I couldn't find like the colors that I wanted and all that stuff. But one of the things that I would like to do eventually is start a makeup brand. Cause I obviously love fashion, makeup, all that kind of stuff. And so I know like, I'm not going to stop wearing it anytime soon. So what I could do is at least like gradually make things better. And until society kind of changes and starts to like the standards of beauty change, you know, until everybody is fine, not wearing makeup, but you know, until we get there, I feel like there could be a transitional phase where I could make that company where we're creating products that are actually trendy, that are colors that we want to wear and all that kind of stuff, but that are not using toxic ingredients in them, you know? And that's so key. And like, I run in, in my practice, I see women with more autoimmune conditions than men. That's what I see. And that's what the studies, that's what everyone's seeing across the US. Why is this happening? And one of my theories is that women are just putting more chemicals on their body. Their, their, their chemical burden is higher than us men. Like how many products is a woman putting on compared to a man? Like me, the products I put on today, zero. Wow. How many have you put on today? Tons. I mean, tons. Yeah. Right. Foundation, mascara, lipstick. Um, and, you know, I'm doing like the bare minimum for today. But like if I have a photo shoot or like a lot of women, like every day they'll wake up, they'll put sunblock and then the primer and then, you know, the foundation and then the powder on top of the foundation you know, and then the eyeshadow, I mean, you know, eyeliner, fake lashes and the glue. <laughs> and you think that it's, it's a cumulative burden over years and years that causes autoimmune conditions. Usually autoimmune conditions don't happen overnight. It's a cumulative yeah. burden of toxicities. Yeah, that, you're so true about, you're so right about this. I, I used to have a sauna um, to kind of try and over, like, um, get rid of as much toxins as possible in infrared sauna in the house. And then when we moved from Miami to Ocala, I sold it um, and I didn't replace it. But I think like that's one of the ways that at least like in the short term that people can do, women can do um, on top of sweating, like when you're when you're running, like every day I'm running six, seven miles. So I'm sweating like a lot. Um, all those things help, you know, drink a lot of water. And obviously, uh, the root cause is eventually actually lowering our burden of um, environmental toxic toxin exposure yes so yeah. bottom line is progesterone we're not sure what it does in men but for women it's critical to their health and well-being dihydrotestosterone dht the more poor, powerful form of testosterone um this one you got to keep track on if you have prostate issues in your family if you have alopecia or so balding dht is thought to be a contributor to these now i don't think it's the sole contributor i think there's other reasons why these problems exist but it's something to be aware of and monitor, especially if you, if you are on testosterone replacement therapy, you want to make sure TRT is not converting into DHT. You can run into some prostate issues and loss of hair. Um, yeah. So and acne too, right? Acne too. Yeah. Oh my God. In women, I should mention in women, dihydrotestosterone and excess androgens is a very common form of acne. 
right? You will uh, commonly, it's a, the, it's a clinical symptom is acne here on the chin, or on yeah. the cheek, yeah, and on the chin. This is uh, androgenic acne in women. Yeah, that's, that's what I've struggled with in the past too. Um, because I was eating all the carbs and I was following the dietary uh, guidelines that I was being taught in dietitian school, <laughs> eating all the carbs, which was spiking my insulin, which then led to increases in testosterone, which led to increased sebum production and thus acne, hormonal adult acne. So, and, and you're pretty fit too. So you may live with a higher testosterone at baseline. And I it, do. Yeah. It helps you maintain your muscle mass very well. But then the trade-off is then you're going to be more prone to acne. Yeah, but no, like, so when I had the really high, the, the, the acne back in the day, I knew it was high testosterone because I would see dermatologists and they would give me all kinds of drugs and they would run labs. And it, we could tell that it's hormonal because my testosterone was like a little bit higher than the maximum. Um, I haven't checked my labs recently, but my acne is 90 95% better just because I no longer eat carbs. Um, and uh, I don't know where my testosterone lies right now, but I'm just glad that I'm not, I can, I don't need to put anything on my face every day. Like I don't need to put foundation. I just like do it, you know, mm -hmm. just amazing. I, figured it out. Yeah, I used to not be able to leave the house without foundation on. So, oh my. Mm hmm. I ordered a PSA on myself here. This is normal. Something decent to track over time. Obviously, you never get too concerned if PSA is elevated. Just riding a bicycle can increase your PSA. So don't like be worried that you have cancer or something. Just go get the lab retested. It's more than likely will be normal the next time. Okay. More on DHT. Um, you know, if you have super high DHT, you can use blockers. You can use like San Palmetto. That's like a natural blocker. Some guys will use finasteride. Uh, finasteride may have some long-term issues, but, you know, I have some guys that really like it. They don't, they don't want to get off it because they're worried about hair loss. So, um, you know, there are methods to treat alopecia out there. And if you have high DHT, that may be something you want to do. Are these prescription-based drugs, the mm -hmm. finasteride? Yeah, yeah, finasteride is prescription. Okay. There's some issue, I think, with it with fatty liver disease. I've been reading some on that. I think it can cause a fatty liver disease on occasion. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, DHEA is known as the anti-aging hormone. Um, so I measure this as a standard in most patients, anyone who comes to me, because sometimes you can supplement with DHEA. And in the US, it's actually an over-the-counter supplement. In other countries like Australia, it's actually a controlled substance because it's a powerful hormone. Uh, it's a precursor to many hormones, estrogen, testosterone, and so forth. So the theory is as you age, this DHEA, it declines. So we may supplement with it to prevent aging. Um, I recently found my DHEA was quite low. So this was a serum lab that I did. And it said that I had adequate DHEA S, you know, not a perfect marker of DHEA, uh, but it's cheap. I did a salivary hormone test and I found my DHEA was low. So I was like, well, I'm 29 years old. I had low DHEA, let's supplement. So I've been doing a 10 milligram DHEA every day. Not very much, very low dose. And I'm going to repeat my salivary lab in about another month to see if there's been any changes. I'm hoping maybe my, even my testosterone comes up higher. Hmm. Um, I've seen DHEA excess though, not in supplementation, but oftentimes in patients who are stressed. So guys who are under a lot of stress or working hard, not getting good sleep, their DHEA goes too high. And that's not a good thing either. Huh. Okay. So yeah, it's an indicator of adrenal stress as well. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Spars, he is a, um, a great lecturer in anti-aging medicine, and he uh, really supports the use of DHEA with age. Okay. DHEA with what? DHEA, just taking as a supplement. Okay. Like the DHEA-S, right? Mm, it, it, it comes as, there's two forms of DHEA out there. There's a, there's a keto DHEA and just the DHEA. I think just find DHEA supplementation um, if you have low DHEA is a fine one. Mm -hmm. um, but I've also seen where this is too weak and it doesn't, if you have like clinical, like low testosterone, right? 
a little bit of DHEA is probably not going to do it. It's going to be like a drop in the bucket. And these guys often need actual testosterone replacement. Got it. IGF-1. This is a marker I've been using for growth hormone to monitor growth hormone as we age. You'll see bodybuilders who do growth, who inject growth, their growth hormone is going to be super high. I've seen this guy 300, 400 plus, right? You mean... They're injecting the IGF-1 to increase their growth hormone level? They're injecting Omnitrope, right? They're injecting Nordytropin. These are uh, growth hormones that were used to treat Turner syndrome. But bodybuilders will use this to boost up their growth hormone, which, you know, has some powerful implications for muscle mass growth, for recovery, for healing. You heal faster. It's uh, quite amazing. Now, I monitor this as a sign of aging. So there is a theory, another theory of aging is that growth hormone declines as you age. And if you can supplement with growth hormone, you can potentially, you know, you don't have to lose your muscle as you age. Your bones are stronger. Your brain is smarter. Uh, your skin looks better. Your organs uh, are, are stronger. There's a uh, growth hormone aff affects your bone marrow, your immune system. So there's, it, it controls every part of your body. And I think it's a great modality to support. Now, you don't have to do injections of growth hormone. We now have uh, growth hormone releasing peptides, right? Like CJC, ipamorelin, sermorelin is one of the older ones, a bit of a weaker one. We have MK677, we have um, IGF1 LR. So these are some injectables. MK677 is the one that is orally available. And these all are growth hormone releasing peptides. And what these do is they signal to the pituitary to release hormones, the growth hormone, uh, more naturally. I think uh, it's a more of a natural way to do it rather than actually injecting growth hormone. Definitely growth hormone is more powerful though. If you really wanna do it, growth hormone probably would do it the way. What are the side effects of injecting growth hormone? And I know it's, uh, you can't, it's not legal, right? Uh, is there any way, first of all, that any? Yeah, no, I, I prescribe this for patients with adult growth hormone deficiency. So it's very interesting. In patients who have a large fat mass predominance, I'm seeing low IGF-1. Huh. So these patients, they come to me, obese. They've struggled for years trying to gain muscle mass in the gym. It doesn't work. They're just sore all the time. They don't grow their muscle and they stay fat. Hmm. These people have adult growth hormone deficiency. And so they actually have an endocrine reason, I believe, why they cannot lose their weight. And so they can do all the diets they want, but their hormone doesn't get better. Okay. So for these so patients, part of their weight less protocol is I put them on a growth hormone releasing peptide to see if that works first. Okay. And how, how has the, your experience been? Does it work? It's positive. No side effects with growth hormone releasing peptides. Wow. Yeah. Okay, that was going to be my next question, if there are any side effects. No, we have not noticed side effects with growth hormone releasing peptides. Okay. Growth hormone itself is re usually really well tolerated. You know, I have a Turner syndrome patient, little girl, 11 years old. She gives herself injections of growth hormone every day. Uh, obviously, she has a genetic reason for this. But, you know, if you have a low growth hormone, there should be no side effect. Wonderful. If you have already adequate growth hormone and you're using it for bodybuilding purposes, uh, you may notice some organomegaly, right? You can grow your, your bone, your forehead may grow bigger. Um, some of your organs may grow larger. So if you're abusing the growth hormone, your organs can get larger. Everything can grow too much. Okay. Then that might be a little bit, you know, you might want to really think before you do that for bodybuilding purposes. Yeah, if you're doing excess growth hormone, yeah, stuff can grow a little bit too much sometimes. Yeah, that's the thing that I love about anti-aging is it's like you're just putting back what your body is naturally losing. You're not doing something that it's artificial. You're just kind of restoring the body to its younger state as closely and as naturally as possible. Yeah, yeah. So patients can qualify for a growth hormone treatment. Um, you know, if they have they have diagnosed adult growth hormone deficiency. And, and we diagnose this here all the time. It's actually you know, surprisingly common. Wow. Okay. Um, here is my NMR lipoprofile. So the NMR lipoprofile, it's more of an advanced cholesterol panel, right? Typically you just get an LDL cholesterol and triglycerides. And, you know, you go to a doctor and say, oh, your cholesterol is high. You need to get on a statin drug. 
<laughs> I have a more advanced interpretation of cholesterol. So before, my, before you dive in, Stefan, don't you think it's crazy that to this day, cardiologists and doctors are still recommending just the traditional blood lipid panel? I mean, we've known about this for a, over, over a decade now. So yeah. how, can, how can that be? Well, one, it, insurance doesn't pay for this test. So that's probably one of the most practical reasons why you would just want to order a standard LDL panel because insurance pays for it. Um, right. And that's probably why. So most practitioners, not myself, because I run a direct primary care, they have to do what insurance companies tell them to do. Mm -hmm. So you can order the panel that they approve. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Eventually, I think they'll get on board with this. But even this advanced level of testing has some flaws to it. So yeah. the new theory of uh, cholesterol accumulation goes something like this. You need to have high inflammation. You can think of your artery like this. If you have high inflammation, it creates little damage in the arteries. This little damage in the arteries, it allows lipid particles to get stuck there. Now, if you have a high number of lipid particles, and if you have smaller, tinier sizes of these lipid particles, it's easier to get caught in the arterial inflammation. If this happens over time, you can collect a little clot and you can get a heart attack and stroke. So you can see here my panel, I have a relatively elevated lipid particle number. So my LDL particle number is 1500, a little bit on the higher end. My LDLC, so this is something you'd get at any regular doctor, is 130. And you know, any regular doctor would be a bit concerned at seeing a, an LDL cholesterol of 130. My triglycerides, however, are great, 53. I think triglycerides are one of the most important markers, even in a standard LDL or lipid panel to monitor for heart disease. My HDL is 52, not bad, it's pretty good. My HDL particle number is uh, a little bit on the lower end, 25. But my LDL size is pretty robust. And you can see here, uh, I believe there is a reference range here somewhere. Yeah, there's a reference range here. So below 20.6. A lipid, an LDL size is pathogenic. So the tinier they are, the more likely they are to get stuck in the artery. The bigger, more robust they are, the more protective they are against uh, arterial disease. So even though I have a high number of LDL particles, they're robust size, they're healthy looking. So they're less likely to get stuck in the arteries. Okay. Yeah. Now I don't end the, the heart screening there. I then look at inflammatory markers. So I look at something called the sedimentation rate. So this is a non-specific inflammatory marker, but patients who have elevated cardiac risk, they're going to have a higher ESR. They have more inflammation going on in their body and in their arteries. Okay. The other thing I measure is the C-reactive protein, CRP. You can see mine is also very low here. One, that's nothing. Okay. I have very low inflammation going on. Another thing I look at is uric acid. Now, a traditional marker for gout. We all know uric acid gout, right? Uh, they think us on an animal-based diet, we're going to get gout. This is not the case. You don't get gout from eating an animal-based diet. You don't get gout from eating liver. You might get gout if you're eating a highly processed diet, you're drinking beer and you're drinking and you're eating meats. Yeah, you might get some gout. Okay. I use uric acid as another marker of inflammation, of stress in my arteries. So I'm good there too. Homocysteine. Homocysteine is another marker of metabolic stress. How much stress is in my arteries? I have low homocysteine. All right, so it's another point in my favor. Here we have the ApoB lipoprotein. And we have some researchers who say ApoB is the most important indicator of heart disease risk. No, ApoB lipoprotein is a transport molecule for LDL. You saw earlier I had higher LDL. Apolipoprotein B is going to be higher. I used to think also that ApoB lipoprotein was the most important thing to, to predict cardiovascular disease risk. It's not the case. Okay. Um, let's see. Apolipoprotein A is the more accurate way to determine HDL in the body, right? The good cholesterol. My apolipoprotein A is adequate, 136. So my HDL that we saw earlier showed a little bit lower. 
I don't think that's the case. I think my HDL is fine. 136, we're good there. Um, and here is my NMR. So when you get this NMR from LabCorp, they give you an insulin resistance score. So it's a calculation of your lipids and it tells you how insulin sensitive you are. I got a really good score below 25. Um, this also concurs with my fasting insulin, probably one of the most important tests we have available to us. And if every American could get this done and could track this rather than following their cholesterol so much, I think we'd have a lot yeah. better health outcomes in the US. Or even just looking at their fasting blood glucose levels. You know, I'd no. rather know the insulin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fasting glucose is inaccurate too. The, the, yeah. It's useless, essentially. Yeah. You say hemoglobin A1C, pretty useless. You want to do a fasting insulin, but unfortunately, this reference range is huge 2.6 to 25. It's a massive reference range. I think it should be between 1.9 and about 5. Yeah. If we had that tighter reference range and we were focused on that. Yeah. We would have better health outcomes. We would have less heart disease. It wouldn't be the number one killer out there. Yeah. That's because those reference ranges, they get them and they, they, they literally look at people who are a lot of times just college students or just adults that don't have a um, diagnosed condition where they have to take insulin or they have to take a drug, you know, and they're considered like healthy people, even though they might already be insulin resistant, but they, then they just recruit them and they're saying, okay, they don't have outward um, diseases that require medications. And so we're just going to use them as healthy controls. And because the vast majority of our um, participants in the study have those ranges of insulin, then we're going to take that and that'll be the reference interval. So you have to pay attention that even the people that they're recruiting aren't really the healthiest people alive. Yeah. And I think the other reason why insulin, fasting insulin isn't measured is because we don't have a drug that can specifically target this. When you measure an A1C and you measure a glucose, we have established drugs, metformin, right? We have other medicines out there that control blood sugar. We have studies that support that. We don't have a way to control insulin. But if you're like us, you understand that an animal-based diet, that improving your muscle mass, making yourself basically harder to kill, will improve your insulin sensitivity. But this is hard. This is more difficult, right? You actually have to get off the couch to do that. <laughs> you have to get off the couch. You have to get to the gym. You have to build your muscle. You need to have the hormones optimized in the first place so you can build your muscle. You need to be following a really good diet. Yeah. Insulin sensitivity is probably the most important thing that you can measure and track and try to optimize for your well-being. Mm -hmm. Everything else will follow along with it. I agree, hundred um, percent. Basically, in my opinion, the cholesterol hypothesis is is dead, essentially. And I like to pull up this study here, the get with the guideline study, about two hundred thirty thousand patients admitted to the hospital with strokes and heart attack. Half of these patients had a normal LDL cholesterol. Yeah. So LDL is not a very good predictor of whether someone's going to have a heart attack or not. Nope. I actually found also another study that they did in another hospital where they showed that 75% of those admitted to that hospital with a heart attack had normal LDL cholesterol. So like their cardiologist would tell them, you're good, you're doing great, you know, but yet 75% of them had a heart attack. It's because these people live with insulin resistance and high inflammation. Yeah. And that's what's going to happen in their arteries. They're going to get all this inflammation and that's why that you know, cholesterol builds up in there because it's able to stick to the arteries. Yeah. Um, but even the American College of Cardiology is making some changes here. You know, they're recommending that maybe not focusing on the LDL or cholesterol is such a great idea. And using dietary carbohydrate restriction, this can actually sometimes uh, improve LDL. It can increase the LDL size, at least in this one study, increase the LDL size in the subjects. Uh, it, it decreased the small dense LDL particles is what I was talking about earlier. And so you get a more protective pattern of these lipids, right? So my lipid panel is protective. So even though I have a high cholesterol, I'm in the protective category. Yeah. Right? You have the good kind of LDL cholesterol. And this is what people don't realize. They just hear that LDL cholesterol is high. They just think automatically that's the bad cholesterol. And that's just not the case. You have different subtypes of LDL. You have the small, dense ones. Those could be a problem only if 
you already have inflammation in the body from seed oils and smoking and sugar and carbs. And then you have the large fluffy kind of LDL, which is great. We want that. I would be more concerned if you don't have enough of that large fluffy LDL, because we know that the lower that kind of LDL, then the higher your chance of developing Alzheimer's disease and just dying sooner than somebody else with higher levels of that LDL. Yeah. And so we use protein leveraging and we use a carbohydrate restriction or more like getting better carbohydrates into the diet. And we, we like to start with carbohydrate restriction because it's simpler, it's easier for patients to follow. But, you know, if you get better carbohydrate, you know, squash, uh, some potato, I think white rice is a pretty decent carbohydrate. Uh, you can get away with some carbs sometimes. And I think it needs to be very individualized to the patients because sometimes uh, they, they don't want to follow strict carnivore for a long term, or you follow their lipid panels and it gets worse, or they, you follow their hormone levels and it gets worse. So sometimes you need to implement some carbohydrates into the diet and just monitoring these parameters will be very helpful. But for the most part, you know, if you recommend to an American to restrict their carbohydrates, that's probably a good suggestion because you know what they're eating. It's not good carbohydrates. Yeah. Um, let's see. So rosuvastatin, if you're going to get on a cholesterol lowering agent, I think rosuvastatin is probably the better one out there. One, it is water soluble. So unlike the atorvastatin, simvastatin, which are lipid soluble, Rosuvastatin doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. And I think there's some issue with these drugs crossing the blood-brain barrier, possibly causing some degenerative changes there. Um, but rosuvastatin also actually lowers inflammation, so CRP. So if you actually have heart disease and you need to get on a statin drug, you know, ask your doctor for rosuvastatin. It's, uh, you know, I'm not sponsored by this company, but just from my research, it's probably one of the better ones out there right. if you have and, and just understand that that's a band-aid. That's like a very short term thing you're doing, but you need to tackle the root cause of your heart disease. Like that should come through diet and exercise and yes. smoking or alcohol. You know, you can't keep doing those and just take a pill, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Here's my white blood cell can. This always comes pretty standard. Everything good here. I always look at the uh, the breakdown of the white blood cells, eosinophils, I monitored this for signs of, you know, chronic allergies, maybe parasite infections. Lymphocytes typically are related to viral infections, but, you know, can be related for any other things. Neutrophils, they tell you back in school, that's more related to maybe bacterial infection. But these things can be elevated for like any number of reasons. So they're very poor predictors of really anything. Mm -hmm. But hemoglobin 14.3, if you're on TRT, testosterone replacement, want to monitor your hemoglobin you produce more hemoglobin, you can run into high blood pressure issues, you got to be doing therapeutic phlebotomy. So uh, donating blood on a regular basis. Um, I think so donating. If, so if Go somebody ahead. if somebody's taking um, testosterone replacement therapy, let's say part of an anti aging protocol, which is yeah. recommended, right? Yeah. Um, then that might increase their risk for hypertension or just drive their blood pressure a little bit higher. And so the recommendation would be to get regular phlebotomy. Yeah, pretty much if you're on TRT, you're going to be doing regular phle phlebotomy because um, you're just going to be producing more red blood cells. And if you have too much red blood cell on board, you're going to have high blood pressure, obviously, because you have just more traffic going through your arteries. Got it. Okay. Um, we monitor here kidney function, uh, 1.08 creatinine. Obviously, creatinine isn't a very good indicator of kidney function. You know, if we take creatine, if we're eating a higher meat diet, your creatinine is going to be higher. And sometimes it can be in the red reverend range. And you're like, oh my God, no, I got to go to a nephrologist. I got kidney disease. No, what you're going to do is you're going to order a cystatin C. Cystatin C is now the recommended way to calculate proper glomerular filtration, which is kidney function. So you go to MD calc there, you put in the plug in the, uh, the cystatin C, the creatine, your age, your sex, and you find that, okay, I don't have kidney disease perfectly fine here. So critical for guys with bigger muscle mass and women too, bigger muscle mass, cystatin C, otherwise you'll just get worried Got it. for no reason. Right. Uh, let's see. Yeah, what else I get we a lot of those questions when we're talking about carnivore diets and eating more meat. Those are like a lot of the questions that I get. And so I'm so glad that we're putting them all together in this like one video for everybody to check out. Exactly. Yeah. Just have these guys get a cystatin C along with their creatinine. Uh, you know, 
have them come to me if they if they want. I can order this whole panel on them, uh, the comprehensive panel, and give them a good picture of their health. Because you know, I don't know if a lot of my colleagues out there are ordering cystanases or understand that bodybuilders are taking creatine. They're eating a lot of protein, and yeah. so the kidney is going to have more creatinine. Okay, yeah. they don't I'm have. I'm sure kidney. they're not. I'm sure they're not ordering this stuff. They have no idea because we're we're operating from a completely different paradigm, which is not what 99% of doctors and physician assistants out there are are doing, right? They're just following mainstream advice, recommending all the carbs and scaring everybody away from red meat. So they have yeah. no idea how all this stuff works. They don't. Here I'm looking at my sodium potassium ratio. I always look at this. You know, sometimes you'll see guys uh, with a, maybe a higher sodium but then usually if they're healthy, their potassium is going to follow along with them. It's all about the balance, about the ratio. It's very interesting how we have that delicate balance of sodium, potassium, and magnesium in the body. And it's really only a big issue if you see, okay, potassium's high and look, your sodium isn't following along here. Uh, then you may be wish worried about some other thing, maybe kidney issues, heart issues, and so forth. So always looking at that balance there. Uh, protein totals, uh, albumin. I always monitor albumin. I, uh, follow that to basically a proxy marker of how much protein patients are consuming. I have patients who really aren't on board with a uh, whole protein leveraging and they'll have super low albumin. So they're not holding on to their water one very well, right? Albumin you, is you mean those are the patients that are not doing all the protein? They're not on board? Yeah. So these are patients who come to me, you know, following kind of a standard American diet. You know, they come to me with a lot of health issues. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll have a low albumin. And so they'll they'll have more water, you know, on their skin, a little, a little bit softer. They're not holding water in their tissues, right? We hold water into our tissues with proper electrolyte balance with albumin. Right. Right. And what else do we have here? We have AST. I forgot the order of the ALT on myself, but AST, very good. I prefer optimal liver function tests, AST, ALT within the teens. So if you see within the teens, 13, between 19, that's optimal. So you can have a transient elevated AST, ALT, don't worry about it, maybe 20s, 26, 30s after a hard workout. So you can see that after a hard workout, just do a repeat to see if that persists. Um, if it's above that, you know, 30, 40, okay, 50, 150, well, what's going on here? Are you consuming Tylenol, alcohol, uh, fatty liver disease? You probably have fatty liver disease if you're that high. Um, and then maybe you know, hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis. These are things not as common. The number one reason for liver transplants is now fatty liver disease. Okay. Wow. Fatty liver disease in pediatrics too. children with fatty liver disease. Transplant risk. Okay. It's a huge epidemic. Um, and monitoring AST, ALT is probably one of the first indicators that you have fatty liver disease. Wow. Okay. So stand C, uh, LDH, not absolutely necessary. I was just kind of ordering off the list here. Um, and it kind of like a, another marker for stress, uh, kind of a lot of stress on the body. So not absolutely necessary, but kind of an interesting one. GGT I kind of was ordering this on myself as a proxy marker for glutathione. So glutathione is the body's master antioxidant. And I've been trying to figure out ways to assess this on patients. I found GGT as maybe if it's higher, it could potentially be related to uh, using more glutathione. Obviously, if you really want to measure glutathione, you want to do more advanced testing, like organic acid testing from like Genova Diagnostics or Great Plains Laboratory. Uh, this is more higher and test kind of expensive, but can give you a better look at your metabolism, your antioxidant use, your vitamin use, your nutritional status. And I did one of these tests to myself and we can go through that one sometime. That one's a whole can of worms. Do you have it? Yeah, I do. We'll have to do another video. It's very long and complicated. Okay, okay. <laughs> you, do you, did you study- Don't tempt me with information. <laughs> did you do biochem or organic chemistry in school? Of course, yeah. As, in, as nutritionists, you have to go and take like tons of chemistry courses. Yeah, so that's basically like a biochem class and that's like really detailed stuff. Okay. Uh, but B12, this is such a great one to mark to monitor. It's easy, it's cheap, and it's a proxy marker for all your B vitamins. I say if you're low in B12, you're pretty much low in everything else too. Right. And I find that to be the case all the time. 
B12 is super important for cognitive function, your nerves, your red blood cell production, your energy. You want to optimize this. And this reference range, again, is low. You want to be 800 above, right? If it's a, in the red line area, that's okay. Don't worry about a higher B12. And maybe you can back off on your supplementation. Usually that's from supplementation. Uh, but, you know, higher B12 isn't an issue. Low B12 yeah, is. And the problem is also they'll take the cheap common form of B12 that does not get converted in the, into the biologically active form by almost 40% of us because 40% of the population have a genetic mutation that prevents us from actually utilizing that cheap common form of B12. So you've got to really be careful about those. You're talking about cyanocobalamin, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, methylcobalamin is like a higher quality supplement. You can get that, you know, injection form oral supplementation, or you can just eat beef liver and beef spleen. Yeah, that's what I generally recommend just organ supplements. Either eat organs or take organ supplements because you're going to get the B vitamins in their methylated form, like methylcobalamin, for example. And so that means they are already biologically active and activated. You don't need to rely on your body to convert it into the biologically active form. And so that way, unless you know your genetic status, that way you're, you're safe, you know, you're not building up um, this less utilizable form of B12. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Here's the full thyroid panel. You go to any doctor that order just a TSH and they'll say, okay, it looks good. We'll call it a day. I've seen even some practitioners dose synthroid or a thyroid hormone based off just a TSH. You no. can't be doing this. You can't be doing oh this. No, you need to be looking at the full thyroid panel. You need to be looking at T3 and T4. So what is T4? T4 is uh, converted into T3. T3 is your active hormone, your active thyroid hormone. Now, if you have a high reverse T3, which I sometimes see patients doing intermittent fasting, they'll put themselves in a chronically stressed state. Mm -hmm. You'll actually get less conversion of T4 to T3. So patients with uh, clinical signs of hypothyroidism, uh, they'll pretty much have a lower T3 pretty commonly, or maybe they'll have a suboptimal T3. So I would actually consider my T3 kind of suboptimal, 2.7. Um, but I have a theory that my thyroid has adapted to my intense tennis activities. So I spend a lot of time in the intense heat training I think my thyroid function, it's low because of that. So it makes me more uh, heat tolerant. So mm -hmm. my girlfriend, she'll be kind of uncomfortable in the house because it's so hot and like, I'm perfectly fine. But this, I think this allows me to go and compete in 90 degree weather for three hours and I'm not suffering so much where maybe other people would suffer so much. So I think this is an adaptive response by myself. Optimal T3 ranges, I'd tell most patients would be between about, you know, three, uh, 3.9. That would be more, more optimal. Very interesting. Uh, I also always measure the thyroid peroxidase and thyroglobulin antibody. These are antibodies that you can measure. If you see these elevated, you can detect full-blown Hashimoto's or Graves' disease about seven years before it actually happens and destroys your thyroid. And that empowers the patient to make the right lifestyle changes. We're like, okay, you've got thyroid peroxidase 500. Okay, you've got thyroid glavin antibody three. You need to go on an autoimmune paleo diet. We need to look at the toxins you're putting on your body, what you're eating, and you can reverse some of this lifestyle. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing that lifestyle changes, if you're ordering the right tests, you can yeah. put it on the map for the patient. I've had patients come to me, female bodybuilders, pushing themselves really hard on uh, birth control. They see this abnormal thyroid function. Everything else looks good. The antibodies are elevated and they're like, oh boy, what am I doing to myself? They back right. off on their training. They're not, they don't push themselves so hard. They get off the birth control. Yeah. And uh, you can maybe save yourself from destroying your thyroid. Yeah. You do not want to end up with autoimmune conditions. Nope. Here's the iron test, full iron panel, right? Iron binding capacity and uh, iron saturation. So all adequate levels here. Uh, my iron binding capacity is kind of low, but this means that I have plenty of iron. If iron binding capacity is high, that means my my body's screaming to, to get iron. Yeah. I have plenty of iron stores. So my body's like, Hey, we don't need to uh, gather more iron. 
Right. Let's see what else we have here. More on iron. Ferritin, this is another marker for iron um, sufficiency, but I also use it as a proxy marker of inflammation. You know? So if you have super high ferritin, your body is stressed. Uh, you have something bad going on. You may have cancer, right? Okay. Um, I wouldn't jump to that conclusion, but if it stays high, you definitely want to think about something very bad going on, um, putting a lot of oxidative stress on your body. Okay. Uh, vitamin A, you can measure this. I measured this with LabCorp. Uh, I have plenty of vitamin A, probably from my beef liver consumption. Vitamin A is an antioxidant, right? It's amazing. Great for skin too. If you want to have that glow and tight skin and not have wrinkles or acne, all that kind of stuff. Vitamin A is your go-to. Vitamin A. Mm -hmm. My vitamin D is 67.5. It's very good. No That's supplementation. Amazing. Yeah, this all is all supplementation. Yeah, this is all natural. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. How, uh, what, what would you describe, what would you ascribe that to just um, training out in the sun and eating, you know, the right foods? Yeah. Uh, nudity. Yeah. I go outside <laughs> backyard. I just take off my clothes and I'll do some pull-ups on my outdoor gym. I have an out. Um, yeah, I try to get out every day, but you know, sometimes uh, just get, take my shirt off and work out in my outdoor gym. I think you know, having an outdoor gym and just working out outside. Yeah. Oh, I get I get kill two birds one stone. I get sunlight and I get a good pump in. Wonderful. Uh, also, a lot of tennis. I don't wear sunscreen, right? I don't sunburn anymore because uh, I think I attribute that to low alcohol consumption, no seed oils, a really good diet adequate hydration with electrolytes, I no longer sunburn mm. and I do not wear sunscreen. Wonderful. Yeah, that's that's the thing. When you when you take out those inflammatory foods, especially the seed oils, which um, are so oxidative and they're so unstable, when you put them in your body, they increase inflammation in your skin as well. So you're far more likely to get burned. So it's like literally frying your skin. Or even when you're using products that are, most of the products, unfortunately, are based off of plant oils. Um, and that's unfortunate because I think that they should be based off of saturated fats that are more stable so that you don't increase the risk of uh, literally frying your skin every time you go out. Yeah, I rarely find patients with adequate vitamin D levels. And adequate for me is, you know, 60 and above. I think that yeah. is optimal. Agreed. Uh, Patients typically 30s, below 30s, maybe yeah. 40s if they're lucky, but 40s with supplementation. Everyone yeah. underestimates how much sunlight they're accumulating. They say, yeah, I go outside. I walk the dog. Yeah. Maybe they're outside at 5 p.m. for about 15 minutes walking their dog. Yeah. You know, download the D-Minder app. You can get it free from the app store and you put in your body weight or the surface area exposed and you go out in the sunlight, you hit the start button and it'll track your vitamin D units. That is so cool. What's it called again? D minder. How do you write that? Like the D and then dash mind, like brain okay. minder. Yeah, okay. it's, it's a fun game to play. You hit the start button, get out in the sunlight and you'll see the score go up to 10,000 units and you know you're good. Oh, so it's like it measures the lux, how much, um, yeah. It measures your geographic region. So how powerful the sunlight It measures what time of day, how much of your body is exposed to the sun. And you can see how rapidly you can accumulate vitamin D on the scoreboard. Yeah. It's fun. Um, another thing that people need to pay attention to, if you have excess body fat on you, that kind of stuff is going to sequester vitamin D. You're going to have lower blood levels of vitamin D. If you have also darker skin tones or more melanin, it's like you have more of a natural sunscreen. So you also um, have a harder time creating that vitamin D. So there are a lot of factors that can influence whether or not that amount of sunshine is enough for you to boost your vitamin D levels to optimal levels. Does glutathione have any role with vitamin D conjugation? Hmm, I, I don't, not sure. I haven't really looked into that. I see. Let's see. Magnesium levels, I consider them pretty useless on a serum laboratory. Um, this is- Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes. I measured it just as a comparison because I got the organic acid testing done and the organic acid testing showed that I was deficient in magnesium. And I think that's because, you know, unlike you, I drink coffee, unfortunately. I know you got <gasps> oh, off the no. Yeah, the coffee depletes magnesium. 
Okay. See, I put makeup on, you drink coffee. Those are our vices. There are vices. <laughs> I take magnesium glycinate every day, though, 200, 400 milligram. You Try do? Okay, well, that's good. Yeah, every I, day. I take magnesium citrate, too, every day. Um, yeah. uh, so what do you think of the red blood cell magnesium test? Would you recommend that? Red blood cell magnesium test? I never ordered that one. Oh, you mean for this? Yeah, like yeah. instead of getting a, a serum red blood cell, uh, I'm sorry, instead of getting a serum magnesium test, instead you could order the red blood cell magnesium. So it's literally looking at the magnesium concentration inside red blood cells as it oh, wow. out in the blood. Oh, that's pretty cool. I, I need to look into ordering that one. Yeah, from what I know is that that's the more accurate test. Like that's the one that you would want to be ordering. So maybe, you know, let me know if you, if you, yeah, there's a lot of debate. I mean, when I did organic acid testing, obviously that's a urinary metabolite. So that's imperfect either uh, as well. Okay, okay. Last part here, we have, uh, I did my SARS-CoV-2 testing and uh, the D-dimer testing. So this was a very interesting uh, test for me because uh, about two months after this, I got the, I got the C. The, oh, the you did. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for protecting my channel. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still traumatized. <laughs> I, I'm partially banned on Instagram. Uh, you are, yeah, I know. It's yeah. like you, so, can't, you can't say the word. Yeah. So it, interesting. And I think it sees consistently with my patients too. Yeah. Antibodies against the C don't indicate you are immune to the C. Mm -hmm. And you know, two months after this, sure enough, I, I got the C. Okay. And I took the horse dewormer. <laughs> <You did. laughs> of course, it works. Yeah. Yeah. And, and? I felt, yeah, I felt fine. I did have a little bit of a low energy. So I started doing uh, NAD. I did okay. NAD, NAD liposomal sublingual. And okay. that felt pretty good. But then I started doing injections of NAD. And I felt really good off that. My energy came back quickly. So I've been using NAD to now treat patients with post COVID fatigue, and it works. That is so cool. How can I get my hands on NAD injections? Oh, I can prescribe it for you. Ooh, okay. So you need a doctor or a physician assistant, somebody to prescribe it. Yeah. And, and um, can you share prices and stuff or like it doesn't? Yeah, yeah. Cover? No, it's pretty affordable. You know, 140 bucks, you can get a thousand milligrams of it. You can inject a hundred milligrams, you know, every other day. Actually for this past tournament, I injected myself subcutaneously every morning before the event and I noticed my energy levels were more consistent right uh -huh. I felt like I wasn't as gassed during these long points this three-hour match that I played and I was like huh what's going on I saw my opponent stalling for time taking longer in between points and I was like what's going on I was kind of annoyed with him and then I thought well that was that was me at the last tournament I was stalling for time and tired what's different this time and I was like oh it's the NAD <laughs> I love it. What would your recommendation be for me, let's say, for an, as part of an anti-aging protocol? What, what would you say would be a good amount for me to take? Yeah, so my mom does the uh, true niagen, the invention by Dr. David Sinclair. She'll do that every day. She actually breaks open the capsule mm -hmm. and she puts it underneath her tongue and holds it there and then drinks it. Mm -hmm. Oral supplementation may be a decent way to get NAD into the diet. I sometimes do the Quicksilver Scientific Liposomal NAD, okay. and I think that one works pretty well. When I was sick with COVID, though, well, when I was tired with COVID, when I had that fatigue, I needed to use way more than the recommended dose to feel energy again. Injectable form of NAD, um, I haven't really thought of that as an anti-aging dose. I've been using that clinically to treat the mitochondrial fatigue and nice. patient chronic fatigue. Um, okay. We'd have to figure out what an anti-aging dose of that would be, but the right. recommended dose is 100 milligram injection every three days. And that 100 milligram injection is what you were referring to as $140? Yep. Okay. Got it. That's, that's, you know, once I'm super rich, I could do it. Sure. You can all do it. <laughs> now, other ways to do it, you can go to an IV infusion spa and you can do NAD drips. But those are kind of tedious. There's about five to six hours. Hmm. Um, yeah, because it needs to be dripped very slowly. Otherwise, it's very uncomfortable. Because it's uh, super more concentrated. I guess so. I'm not sure why it's so uncomfortable. Patients often don't like it. They don't tolerate it very well. Got it. Okay. Uh, I, I tolerate the injection perfectly fine. You'll feel a rush, though. You'll feel the rush of blood flow to your head when you do it. Okay. 
Yeah. So and the other thing I mar I checked here was my D-dimer. A D-dimer, okay. you know, that's a classic test used in the emergency department as a pulmonary embolism rule out criteria. You think a patient has a blood clot, you order a D-dimer. If it's negative, great. If it's positive, well, maybe you have to do a CAT scan. I'm using it a bit differently here. In the, uh, the post-C era, I'm seeing patients that run with chronically elevated D-dimer levels. And this can't be a good thing, right? We know D-dimer is associated with clot formation, a little bit of oh. microclots breaking off. Uh, wow. And I've been seeing these elevated both post C and post jab is that this D dimer is elevated. And we know that these patients have increased risk of clots, strokes, uh, heart attacks. Uh, so this is something I'm monitoring. And if I see this elevated, I put patients on some protective medications for this. What are some of those protective medications? A basic aspirin. Uh, yeah. Oftentimes I will use natokinase, so neprinol. For uh, how long? Until it comes down. So as long as a patient has this elevated, I consider them to have at risk for venous thromboembolism and uh, heart attack and stroke. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's so very we, interesting. And I have a whole post-COVID protocol. I follow some of the FLCCC's guidelines for yeah. post-COVID syndrome. It's a whole deal. I have a whole YouTube video on that as well. Right. Uh, these patients, they struggle a lot with high inflammation, chronic fatigue, pain, yeah. brain fog, you name it, they have yeah. it. My husband, I don't know if I ever mentioned that, um, had had a reaction post the, you know, mm. thing. And um, he like just had palpitations after the second, um, I don't even want to say it, but you know what I mean, you know, after the second one, um, started having a lot of, you know, palpitations for a quite, quite a while, for months, we were very worried, you know, wow. thankfully it subsided, nothing happened, you know, and it's like, okay, you were right, I was wrong, <laughs> I shouldn't have, but yeah, because he's, you know, super fit, super healthy, you know, they're like, we should, he, he's, he shouldn't have, you know, no. But anyway, that is, that is scary. And um, yeah, you definitely want to look at some markers if that's the case and see what's going on and maybe get on some treatment because there is treatment out there. And I, I do that in FLCCC members all treat these sort of uh, scenarios. Yeah, maybe you could, you know, like text me, what would you recommend like tests that we could run? So we basically you know? want to order these tests. We want to order these inflammatory markers, see if there's yeah. cardiac risk still ongoing. Would you it, say the CRP as well? CRP, D-dimer, ESR, well, uric okay. acid, NMR lipo profile. Okay. Uh, all of those. Cool. Okay. Good. Yay. We covered them? We covered it. Yay. That was so, so educational, so important. And I'm so glad that we got to cover Every single major important lab test that you could order for, we talked about for different purposes, really. I mean, for anti-aging, for post the thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you did take it or if you caught it. Um, and also um, just if you're following an, an animal-based diet, you know, and maybe you're worried or you want to feel good about your labs. Those are all the labs that you would want to look into. So thank you so much, Stefan. Do you feel like we forgot talking about something important? No, we pretty much covered everything you can do on blood work. Yeah. Um, and I guess the hormone replacement therapy, because I did have a question here about um, if there are any risks. I, I think I already asked you this in the first interview we did, but I want to ask you again, because for me, anti-aging is a big deal. I'm passionate about that. And I feel like, what's the point of living unless you're doing everything you can to extend your life? It's like, what's the point of doing anything, going to school, getting a job, all that stuff, if eventually we're just going to like die. So it's yeah. like, I don't want to die. And I know that there's enough science and progress being made that if we take this stuff seriously, it's a, you could totally significantly slow down the rate of aging and then eventually reverse it. Yes. Like, this is not crazy talk. This is like, I, I listen to, you know, doctors and researchers and I've interviewed them on my channel and I like, the stuff is out there. It's happening. Just people need to know about how, how many, uh, how much progress we're making. So 
So hormone replacement therapy, a lot of people um, probably should know more about that. And I feel one of the things that's stopping people from taking that is this belief that they have risks. And that may have been true for like the older generation of HRT. What are your thoughts on the newer generation? Um, so the older generation, there's a lot of, uh, especially for, if you're talking about female hormones, there's some trials back in the day that used, you know, horse type of estrogen. Right. And, and it gave women heart attacks. It was a bad deal. We don't right. do that anymore. We don't use Premarin. Um, if you do hormone replacement, you can do it safely. You monitor the levels. You give back a therapeutic dose just to maintain the levels that you normally would have if maybe you had half the age that you had, or maybe if a third the age or fourth the age that you had. Um, if you're clinically symptomatic, right? You monitor the levels. Do you have a clinical symptom? Optimize it, right? Monitor. Do you feel better? Great. Do you don't feel anything? Okay. But do you feel negative side effect? No. Do your levels look better? Yes, this is probably anti-aging mm -hmm. for men. There was a lot of belief that testosterone replacement causes prostate cancer. Uh, this is not the case. Dr. Morgan Tyler has been doing amazing research, giving actually prostate cancer patients testosterone replacement, not accelerating their prostate cancer, not making them die of prostate cancer. Most patients actually die with prostate cancer rather than dying of prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the testosterone placement myself doesn't cause prostate cancer. Um, aging the, causes cancers. A, aging causes cancer. Doing whatever we can to slow down or reverse the aging process is going to lower your risk of getting cancer. Uh, yes, there's other ones. Uh, growth hormone. People believe that growth hormone causes cancer. And if you have active cancer, you probably wouldn't want to do growth hormone. But if you don't have cancer and you have adult growth hormone deficiency, growth hormone can be life changing and it can possibly save your life. Um, so hormone replacement is safe. It's effective. It can help people drastically improve their life and help them live not only longer, but better lives throughout their, their, their years remaining on earth. And that's why we do it. Love it. Yeah, that's, that, was, that was a good ending. Do you want to add anything else, Stefan? No, I think we covered it. I'm glad that we got to cover this because I want this material out there. I want patients to be able to ask their doctor for the right test, demand it. If they're not doing these tests for you, um, you know, hire find them. <laughs> and find hire Stefan. Find someone better. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much, Stefan. I'm going to, well, actually, let me ask you, where can people find you? And I know that I'm going to link everything in the description box below, but yeah. where can people find you? You can go to my website, irondpc.com, Iron Direct Primary Care. I'm on YouTube, Iron Direct Primary Care, and Instagram, why they haven't banned me yet. Not on yet. Twitter as well. I'm on Twitter there too. I'm getting in trouble on Twitter. And Rumble, Rumble, I'm on Rumble, but I haven't figured out how to use that very well. Yeah. I haven't, I'm not on Rumble just yet. And um, I, I try, I, I try not to like go there as much, you know? Um, and I, I try to like kind of diversify my content as much as possible, but it's kind of, it's hard when you are in this field and you want to share information to everybody, not just to the clients that you're working with one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, we are being censored for sure. And there are a lot of, you know, companies that their bottom line, their profits um, are at risk as more and more people are enlightened as to what is the right way to go about it and how to treat the root cause and, mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff. So Yeah, everything that we're advocating can disrupt the billion dollar industry of yeah. treating symptoms rather than treating root causes. When we do anti-aging medicine, when we do hormone replacement, we're not treating symptoms, we're treating a root cause. And that root cause is often abnormal hormones is what I've found. Interesting. Yeah. Hormones are such a huge topic. So thank you so much, Stefan. Thank you all for sticking with us till the end. I hope you enjoyed this kind of content. If you did, make sure you give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that little notification bell icon so YouTube alerts you every time I post a new video. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one. See ya.